Welcome everyone to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. Joining me and co-hosting today's show, the Farnsworth Art Museum to my Colby College Museum of Art, Curtis Worcester. How are you doing today, Curtis? I'm doing well, Ben. Doing well. How are you? Good. Good. Um, we're we're now back to school season. Um, you know, pumpkin is everything right now. And That's right. You know, everybody's got to go into apple and pumpkin. So we're we're going into fall and back to school and all that. So, hey, when it comes to back to school, of course, our show is a little bit of uh, education here, too. And we dig into retirement. We dig into Mm -hmm. kind of some life decisions and choices. And as as many of you know out there, we're investment advisors by day, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, podcast superheroes by night. And, you know, we, one thing we want to get into is on the education side is, um, you know, we want to get into a little bit of a few things that our clients have heard about private equity yeah. and they're bringing that up to us. What's this private equity? And I hear that in the Wall Street Journal or in the news. Mm-hmm. And I want to, I want to consider investing my own money in these sorts of things. Sure. Right. So we're, we're hearing that on a, on a uh, frequent basis. And there's times when clients of friends are asking about it and they don't even really know what it is. Hmm. So the question is, what is private equity? Hmm. How does it work? Who can invest in it? But also how is this investment trend impacting the state of Maine? Yeah. So one thing to quickly point out for a lot of Mainers is they might already have some of their retirement in private equity without even realizing it. And we all know teachers, firefighters, uh, police officers, state of Mm -hmm. Maine and government employees. Mm -hmm. Well, they all uh, have a Maine public employee retirement system. Otherwise, Maine PERS or MPERS. And it's an $18.7 billion fund. And it has over 15% of its fund investments in private equity. And that was from a 2021 MPERS report. So if I'm doing some quick math, um, which, you know, we like to do math here, uh, (laughs) that's about $2.8 billion. So private equity is also having other impacts on the state during the past few years as well. We've talked to many business owners in the state and New England that are receiving and sometimes accepting offers from private equity funds to buy their businesses and combine them with other national, regional, and or local businesses. Is that a good trend or should we be suspicious of these pools of money coming into the state? So all those things we want to cover in today's show. Yeah, exactly, Ben. And, you know, I think while we have some kind of, uh, exposure and knowledge in private equity here ourselves, just given the nature of our business, we obviously wanted to bring in an expert. Um, So today's guest is, uh, I think, the perfect expert. He's the head of private equity uh, in Vanguard's portfolio review department. So his areas of expertise are investment strategies, including private equity, indexing, active and factor, as well as investment products, including mutual funds, collective investment trusts and ETFs. Um, in 2022, our guest became the head of private equity, leading a team of ex- experts responsible for the strategy, marketing, and investment support of Vanguard's private equity offer. So prior to this role, he uh, led the ETF and index product management function at Vanguard. So leading a team of experts responsible for conducting surveillance of competitors' products and positioning, meeting with clients and prospective investors to discuss Vanguard's ETF lineup, publishing noteworthy developments in the ETF marketplace and Vanguard products, improving existing products, developing new products, and supporting ETF education initiatives. Um, So our guest uh, joined Vanguard in 1999 and assumed an investment analyst role in the portfolio review department in 2003. So for the majority of his tenure in the portfolio review department, he served as a senior member of the oversight and manager search team, which is responsible for identifying advisory partners uh, for Vanguard's actively managed funds lineup and monitoring the firms, people, processes, portfolios, and performance of all existing Vanguard funds on behalf of the firm's global investment committee and uh, the board of directors. So a f- He's a frequent speaker at industry conferences. He's also widely quoted in the media and has made numerous national television appearances on the topic of ETFs. He earned a bachelor's in science business administration and finance from Shippensburg University and an MBA in investment management from Drexel University. So 
with that wonderful background, um, please join me in welcoming Rich Powers to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. Rich, thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show today. Hi, uh, Curtis. Ben, thanks for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, and, and Rich, uh, you know, again, with that background and kind of the looking at private equity is something we all want to learn about. Um, and in your role here with Vanguard, uh, an industry leader, uh, leader here, and we're all we're all really big Vanguard fans as well. So right. really excited to have you on our show and and talk a little private equity. Again, we're going to take the the role of the the public out there and our clients that are asking questions. We want to be asking questions from yep. their perspective today from uh, to you. And, and Rich, we always want to dig into our guests a little bit just to get to know you and your path towards your, um, your role today. So love for you to just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and whether you were destined for a career in finance. Yeah. Um, well, sure. I'm, I'm not sure I was destined for a career in finance, but there's certainly some seeds planted pretty early that, that led me on this path. But uh, a bit of my background, I'm actually... Um, born and bred in this area. I, I grew up just on the outskirts of Philadelphia, about five minutes from the international airport. Uh, my parents are actually still in the same house I was raised in. So it's been, it's been a longstanding place for our family. Uh, I'm one of four boys. I'm the oldest of, of, of the group. And you know, my parents definitely impressed upon us the importance of education and all the doors that that would open for us. Uh, so uh, what, what I didn't know was that Vanguard was not too far away from where I grew up, but about a 30 minute drive from where I grew up and mm. uh, certainly couldn't have imagined that I would end up working at this organization for almost 24, year, 24 years now, not having known it growing up. Um, I think in terms of my uh, path towards investing, um, I, I do remember early as, as a child watching the news with my parents. And one of the things that always caught my eye was uh, there would be a recap of what happened in the markets. So the, mm -hmm. the, the Dow was up, the Dow was down. And uh, for some reason, that, that was always something that I was uh, paying attention to. Even though my family didn't really have any investments to speak of themselves, there was something about um, measuring what was happening in the economy of the markets that, that intrigued me. And so as I progressed to study uh, business in, in undergrad, uh, that became a little clearer as to what that would look like uh, and had the good fortune of... of um, having some friends who had graduated from school a little earlier than me that also were from the Philly suburbs that had gotten jobs at Vanguard hmm. and knew, knew that I was interested in coming back to the Philly area and knew my interest in investing and pointed me in that direction. And uh, yeah, I feel really fortunate for, for that having happened. That's awesome. And, and as you said, uh, Rich, so you've been at Vanguard now for almost 24 years. Um, what has it been about Vanguard that you think has been such a great fit for you in your career? Yeah, I, you know, certainly uh, I would love to say that I had had it all mapped out and planned that Vanguard was going to be the perfect place because of its mission orientation and what I was trying to do uh, with my life. But that that certainly would, would, would not be the case. That, you know, it was good fortune that led me to Vanguard. But uh, what's what's kept me at Vanguard is actually um, the mission orientation of who we are. Right? We, we, we exist to serve our investors. And that is it. I, the, there's no outside in, investors or owners of Vanguard. Mm -hmm. Our funds own the Vanguard group clients own the funds and therefore those clients are effectively our owners as well. And so it creates a lot of clarity in terms of uh, the ability to do the right thing uh, for investors since we exist only to serve them. So I think that's that mission orientation. Well, I didn't appreciate that as a, a younger guy, mm -hmm. certainly as I got older and was able to interact with others in the industry and friends who were working elsewhere, it became pretty clear to me that uh, where I landed was, was pretty different and pretty special. I, I think uh, even more personally, um, the opportunity to grow and take on new responsibilities uh, has been uh, just incredibly compelling for me. And, and uh, to think back where I, my, my initial job at Vanguard was um, all, working on our 1-800 number for individuals who would call up and say, hey, I want to open up an IRA or I'm thinking about funding an account for my, my child. Can you help me figure out how to allocate capital or send me the right paperwork uh, to uh, for, to over time becoming a senior member of our oversight search team that was responsible for working for our board and set, assessing our managers and making sure that the right people and process philosophy were there. Uh, then I led our ETF team where was responsible for helping us build out that lineup further, representing us in pretty high stakes engagements with clients and with the press, and then now leading our private equity team. 
I, I just look at that as I've had probably four or five different careers in a 24 year period and never had to leave the company because Vanguard is, is involved in so many different things and they reward folks who work hard, who have talent and have that longer term view. And so I've been a big beneficiary of that. And so I'm really appreciative that I happened to land here in a kind of a happenstance way right out of college. Uh, but but um, it, it's been a wonderful experience for me for all this time. Rich, and I'll, I'll add it too, just kind of, uh, again, watching Vanguard from afar, um, you know, Maine to uh, to Pennsylvania here is, is kind of looking at what, what's been pretty neat about the evolution of Vanguard as a company is this uh, idea of, look, we're starting with our clients first. And when there's products that make sense for our clients, that's when we do it, not, well, let's look at the profit we can get out of products. And that's when we're going to start leading into it. So, you know, there's been other organizations that might be quicker in terms of like getting getting something out. But when you go, hey, when does it make sense to do this for our clients? When is there demand? And when is there a need to incorporate something on the investment side that we think cl our clients need and should have in their portfolios? Let's start with that as the demand. And I could see where that has caused the evolution of an organization, but also to say, hey, here's Rich and we have somebody that's really great as a, as a, with, with talent and we can continue to put him in all these situations of, of growing with us and leading us and, and uh, kind of retaining talent, I guess, is the point I want to say there is it's really important that, you know, when you develop talent and you develop kind of this thinking and there's alignment and mission, I think it's a really important thing as an organization. So inside and outside kind of need to see that not only just what the story is to what we tell people, what we tell people um, on the Vanguard side, but also when you talk to um Folks like yourself, uh, we worked with uh, Kelly Orr for a long period of time. And Kelly is so fantastic <laughs> and really lives and breathes Vanguard. And it just it's it's so synergistic across the way. So uh, just I don't know, from uh, from kind of what we see as an investment advisor or independent is kind of applauding kind of that part. And but I also want to ask another question, Rich, about you. We always ask the question of you know the name of the show is Retirement Success in Maine. Any connections to Maine at all? You know, I, I've only spent time in Maine for um, work, actually. I, I visited Maine for meeting with clients before. Uh, gosh, it's probably been a, at least 10 years now since I've been there. And so I, I don't have any family connections. I don't have any, uh, you know, it's not like a, a vacation spot for me, but certainly is on the list of places for me to visit. And a lot of it has to do with everyone around me seems to spend a, a, an incredible amount of time in Maine. Uh, during the summer season or even even during the winter and so clearly i'm missing something and and, and so it's on my short list of places to visit uh in the not too distant future well we'll get you that list of uh foods you must try when you come to the state because uh, uh it's it's there's a lot of really great experiences but also food is uh you know when you're yeah. this close to the ocean and you're getting all the best and freshest things it, it must try so well when you come up give us a holler we'll we'll get you that list <laughs> I'm holding you to it, Ben. Okay, please. <laughs> We're pretty easy to get to, too, especially yeah. from you if you're right near Philly. Speaking yeah. of someone who flies out all the time, Philly's yeah. the spot. That's what I feel like everywhere I connect, it's Philly. Direct so. flight, right? That's right. Straight up. Um, um, yeah, well, okay. you know, and even the drive isn't that that terrible. I mean, I, I actually, I, I, uh, plenty of the folks actually I work with have made the commute during the, the during this summer. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the benefit on getting... Uh, Maybe the trip itself can be a little arduous at times, but the, on the other side of it, the, the benefits are very clear to them. So yeah. uh, clearly it's something we need to prioritize. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, so I want to keep moving Rich here and, and really dig into this, our topic today, obviously private equity and your retirement, really just what, what should people know? And I think a great kind of way to start all of our shows is we just like to start with definitions. So the, the first question I want to ask you is, can you just walk us through what exactly private equity is? Sure. Uh, so I, I think a lot of the listeners will be familiar with public equity, right? So this is these are companies that are publicly traded on exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Uh, these are uh, many times large companies, but oftentimes it can be small companies as well that uh, you'll, you'll see quoted, just like I was uh, alluding to earlier on the, on the nightly news talking about how did the market do. Uh, that's what mm -hmm. you're seeing is what did the public markets do uh, for a given day, for a given week, for a given year? Um, these companies uh, have public shareholders, so um, meaning they have probably insiders who own some of the company, but then uh, Curtis or Rich or Ben could 
also be individual investors in those companies. And then they might uh, also have uh, owners who are mutual funds or mm -hmm. other investment funds. So think of the Vanguard 500 index or the, the Windsor fund. They might own shares in that company. And so it's a pretty, oftentimes when you think about a public company, they think of them as having a broad base of investors from employees and kind of executives at the firm to individuals, uh, mutual funds, pensions, what would have you. In private equity, um, what you have is companies that are not quoted on an exchange like NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. They're not readily traded uh, where you can easily uh, exit a position that you hold in a private company and sell it to some other um, buy, potential buyer like you could on any given second effectively for a, a, a public company. Sure. Uh, and, and, so that, and the ownership may, may tend to be relatively narrowly held, right? There might be the founder might own the, 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 the company in its entirety or their family or a founder and some friends, uh, or there will be other investors along the way who would be what we call general partners of private equity funds who are making infusions into that business for any number of reasons, which we'll get into in a little, little bit. And so uh, uh, there's, there's uh, lots of similarities between public and private companies, but there's some key differences. I, I'd say just one, one other key similarity I want to point to before I break here is that uh, you know, we're really familiar with public companies that uh, there's, they come in all shapes and sizes and forms, right? There, there's no monolithic public company, right? There's different mm -hmm. sectors, there's different uh, sizes of companies, there's different geography fees in which they operate. There's this idea that some companies are more value oriented, some are more, more growth oriented. Same holds true in, in private equity. You know, the, the, the ways you slice the, the, uh, the different companies in private markets can be a little bit different, right? You can have really early stage companies call them um, you know, two people in a garage with an idea. You can have really mature businesses that are looking for additional funding to expand operations. Uh, you know, those companies can be here in the US, they can be elsewhere. And so, uh, and they're gonna cover different sectors as well. And so mm -hmm. I, I just point to that there are lots of similarities to uh, uh, public companies that the private companies have, uh, but there are some key differences that, that, that I think we should probably kind of dive into. Yeah, and, and that's great. You're kind of teeing up my next question here. So when, when someone chooses to invest in private equity, can you just talk about some of the unique, again, it may be something that's different than public equity, um, some unique things to private equity that may they may not have encountered when they do invest in their publicly traded stocks? Sure. I think there's a, a range of things that are, are pretty different, but I'll hit on a couple that I think are, are really key and fundamental to the differences. Um, perhaps the most significant one is the illiquidity of a private company, right? Yeah. So going back to where we started earlier, where if you owned a Microsoft and, and you wanted to sell that on the a public exchange, you could easily do that with it, with a, within a second with a brokerage account. If you own a private company, there isn't a, an exchange, a marketplace, an auction for you to easily transact in that, in that type of uh, uh, ownership of a company. And, and so therefore, your time horizon when you're investing in private equity has to be materially different. Um, and, and, in, and in many cases, like uh, people are stunned at this as, as we've started to get, uh, make a private equity avail uh, option available. Uh, the, the time horizon for private equity investing, uh, as much as we have long-term clients here at Vanguard, uh, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty lengthy, right? You're talking about mm -hmm. a 10 to 14 year time horizon when you're investing in these companies because you want to give that company the opportunity to make the investment scale evolve uh, to realize its full potential. And it may need to do, it may need a long period of time to do that. So I think illiquidity is uh, perhaps the, the most obvious difference between a public company. Uh, the second one I would point to is be the potential for uh, enhanced returns. Right? Mm -hmm. If you are locking up your capital for 10 or 14 years, I think you're going to require a, uh, a payment for that additional uh, you know, lockup, right? Just like, um, if you loan someone some uh, money for a day versus loaning them something for 30, 30 years, you're, yeah. there's a lot of risk that goes in that 30 year time horizon you want to price in. And so um, there's an illiquidity premium that comes with investing in private companies because you're locking up your capital for a long period of time. And that is generally translated into uh, a, a return enhancement for private equity investments over public markets. Obviously mm -hmm. it comes with a bit of a lockup. Uh, sure. I mean, maybe the third thing I point to, and, and then I'll pause is, uh, with, with private equity, um, it's, it's not transparent, 
right? It goes back to it's not a public company, so they don't have to file the same type of regulatory uh, documents that a public company has to in terms of disclosing operations, profitability, and uh, they, they, they will have to share that with certain folks, but it's not like it's publicly available on the, on the SEC website. Uh, here, it's, it's, it's far more of a bit of an opaque marketplace. And so uh, that asymmetry actually translates into um, you know, some things where an investor who might buy into a private equity fund actually doesn't know what's going to be held in that fund because the manager is going to build that portfolio over the next couple of years. I, I, I contrast that with if you want to look at what was held in the Vanguard 500 ETF, you could pull that up on any given day and know yep. exactly what you hold. In private yep. equity, there's a bit of a blind pool that you're investing in that, that requires lots of due diligence and a little bit more faith in terms of the quality of the manager that you're hiring there. Yeah, no, those are great. Those are all three fantastic points, Rich, and I'm glad you you broke each of those out the way you did. Um, one last kind of lump it into our foundational questions. Um, obviously, we just talked in the intro, the state of Maine has some exposure in their public uh, retirement uh, system, if you will, to p- private equity that people may or may not know about. So we just want to ask, can you just give us an example of a company that people might know and recognize that was whether recently or, or not recently purchased by a private equity fund and how or how it didn't change the company? Yeah, I think uh, folks will be pretty surprised to know that many companies that are really brand name and well-known, and ubiquitous in, 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 the, in the global marketplace, uh, had their start as a private equity investment that translated to a public company. Uh, I'll, I'll actually give you two, because I think it'll be really important to kind of draw a distinction in terms of this um, the private equity is this umbrella term, but takes many different forms. So uh, the first one will be Uber, right? So Uber was founded in 2009. It's a ride hailing service. Obviously it's involved in a variety of other different activities as well. Um, it, it went public in 2019. And but between 2009 and 2019, mm-hmm. there was a series of investments that were made uh, by angel investors, venture investors to help capitalize the business from this idea to a, uh, actually operating company and then to allow it to grow and scale into this global platform. And so Uber uh, is a relatively new conversion from a private company to a public company just about three years ago. Uh, another example would be Dell. So D- mm. D- Dell actually is a kind of interesting history. Right? Dell was founded in 1984 by Michael Dell. Uh, a home computer, computers is kind of uh, the business they're involved with. They went public in 88. We're a public company for about 25 years. And then in 2013, we're taken private by Michael Dell and some private equity investors um, to help uh, right-size the business, rethink strategy, uh, pull, pull them out of the, of the glare of the public marketplace to allow them to make some meaningful changes there. And then they, re, they IPO'd about five years later. And so uh, just, a, just an example of, an, an, uh, of, a com- of companies that started off as a, a really uh, small idea that became a, went from private to public, and those that have kind of gone from private to public yeah. to private and now that being <laughs> well, Rich, I, that's that's really awesome, and especially when um, again when we kind of talked about now what it, what private equity is and what it entails, and one of the things that we were kind of saying in our intro was, look, we're getting people that are coming up and saying, hey, I've heard about private equity, and I. I hear if you can make some money in it and I'm interested in learning about it and I want to maybe think about doing it myself. So I think that leads to a question of who, who can invest in private equity and who is it typically most appropriate for? So that's what I want to kind of get into and maybe ask that question to you right now is um, because it's, it's something where, again, if I have a, you know, to your point of, I want to go buy a stock on the public stock exchange, you know, if I have, you know, if I find a stock that's a hundred dollars a share and I have a hundred dollars, I could go just buy that and, and, and open up an account through, uh, through Vanguard or whoever custodian, and I could go do it where, so this, this is a little bit different, right? Can you explain, uh, what that is and who, who's eligible to invest in this? Sure. And, and, and all of this is a, a bit fluid here, but I'd say mm-hmm. historically how to think about private equity is that, uh, private equity uh, investments have been only available in as private placements, where um, it, it's not a public fund that you go to a brokerage account. Rather, you would work through a, a general partner or a fund of funds provider to access the private equity equity market. Uh, and private equity requires uh, usually requires a uh, asset threshold that that is necessary to meet 
in order for you to qualify. That, that's said actually, but from a regulatory standpoint, this is a, uh, a rule that uh, SEC uh, requires that say institutions need to have $25 million in investable assets incident to be eligible for private equity. For individuals, it's about 5 million. By the way, I'm just offering a shortcut sure. interpretation yeah. of the regulatory yeah, yeah. filings. Yeah. It's more nuanced than that. But, but it, what that tells you is that uh, by and large, private equity has historically only been available to uh, large institutions and, and ultra high net worth investors because those $25 million asset test um, or $5 million asset test for an individual, what that says is, well, you probably have, a, you need to have a lot more than that to start allocating to private equity because you're not going to invest everything you have in private equity. Otherwise you wouldn't have any liquidity. And so uh, what that's translated into endowments, foundations, sovereign wealth funds, pensions, largely being the historical owners of private equity and then uh, ultra high net worth investors uh, owning it as well. And uh, Rich, in terms of maybe, again, this is, uh, I'm not trying to put words in regulatory agencies' mouths here, but there's kind of this um, kind of influenced or uh, implied uh, thought. It feels like from regulatory agencies of like, hey, there's a risk, there's maybe greater risk because of what you just said of, hey, illiquidity, maybe I don't have access to it. Maybe there's more risk where I don't know the value on a day-to-day basis. So I don't know, maybe maybe there's more things I just don't know and there's more risk to these sorts of investments. So with that, we want we want kind of the, the people that are investing this to maybe be able to absorb more chance of a risk of loss, it feels like from that versus uh, again, I, if I only have $100 and that's all I have to my name and I put it into one publicly traded stock, again, on a daily basis, I have a value on what's happening with that where it's a little less on the, on, would you, I guess, would you agree with that to, as a kind of a, as a thought from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, I think that's the right interpretation, right? It's, it's, it's meant to, uh, for, first of all, I, I would say we and, and others uh, believe that private equity isn't for everyone, right? Mm-hmm. I think there's a range of factors you have to consider in terms of uh, need for liquidity, risk tolerance, uh, time horizons, all that needs to be considered. And so uh, uh, so even before you get to the wealth continuum, you, you can easily start kind of lopping off a bunch of folks who where private equity is simply not going to be a fit. Uh, but but e- even with that remaining population, I think what the regulators are simply saying is uh, the, the capacity to absorb and, 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 and uh, some, some of the challenges that come with investing in private equity are, are probably better uh, served by those uh, individuals or institutions that have a quote unquote larger balance sheet so that they, uh, if something goes wrong uh, for those investments or it takes a lot longer to realize returns than, than expected, those folks are, are not going to be uh, harmed in an like, irreparable manner from a, a financial situation. And so I think that, that's been a historical perspective. Certainly uh, we as, as, as an organization think that there is an opportunity and many others do as well, opportunity to bring private equity to more investors recognizing you still have to meet all these other suitability requirements that are so fundamental uh, uh, b- before you even get to the asset threshold. So let, so that's a really great, I think, definition of then the the who. So let's talk about, obviously, um, we have, we, we mentioned in our intro about the main public employee retirement system having 15% to, as a target of their money and and private equity. But let's talk about them or Harvard's or Yale's or other public pensions. Why do they like private equity as an asset class so much? Because when you, when you say 15% or, uh, you know, maybe even more, that's a pretty significant chunk of, of any pool of money to say, hey, this is an asset class I'm putting into. What, why is it that they've liked it um, so much maybe today or, or previously? Yeah, I think um, one of the unique characteristics for those entities is that they're really, you classify them as perpetual, right? That the Yales, the Harvards of the world, they will continue to be educating uh, people for the foreseeable future, right? And so uh, they have a time horizon that's as close to infinite as you probably can think of in terms of the uh, relative to say an individual investor who obviously has a, uh, a specific timeline. So I, I think that that allows them to uh, think about investing in this manner a much much in a much easier fashion than than uh, you know the average person would. I think the other factors you would point to would be returns, right? Like these organizations are doing this 
uh, not because they, they simply can, right? They have to have access, but rather because there is a return profile historically for private equity that has demonstrated an outperformance over public markets, right? And you, depending upon the time period, you can uh, uh, you come up with different measuring points, but hundreds of basis of points of outperformance over public markets by, by top private equity firms. Uh, that's an attractive um, uh, aspect of private equity investing that has been uh, one of the reasons why uh, endowments like Harvard and, and Yale have invested that matter. Uh, I, I think you also have to remember they have large pools of capital, right? So going back to our mm-hmm. point earlier that you actually need uh, uh, large dollars to invest, those uh, entities have billions of dollars of capital to invest in. So, uh, you know, I think those are the reasons why you get there. I, I'd also throw in maybe the last one, which is, uh, I think there's some debate about the, the value of this, though I, I certainly um, can, can see it. It's diversification, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and the reason why there's a little bit of debate is like some folks will point to, well, the part of the reason why private equity offers diversification benefits is because you only value the assets every quarter while public markets can be valued every day. And perhaps that's kind of the driver of a diversification benefit. I'll concede that. But even if you, if you assume that that was, um, you know, you normalized everything and everything was on the same time horizon, you'd still have some uh, benefits from a diversification standpoint in terms of returns zigging and zagging at different times. I think diversification also comes in the form of simply accessing a segment of the market that is growing in size that you can't access through the public markets. I think the figure that I saw recently is if you looked at the global market cap, about 10% of the global market equity market cap is comprised of private private companies today, and that number is growing rather rapidly. Uh, you know, about a half a point or so per year. Uh, and so, as as uh, investors, diversification is the only free lunch we have access to. And so, uh, that that is a I think a, a part of the selling point that I think organizations like those consider when, when making private equity allocations. Mm. That's great. Um, so I want to keep going on the kind of fundamentals of private equity funds. So typically, right, they have a life cycle on how they invest for their clients. So can you just talk about the typical stages of how a private equity fund works and maybe get into what is a J curve? Sure, sure. I think there's really um, what I call three phases of, of, of private equity investing, right? So, so, um, and, and maybe I'll just take a little diversion here and say like, there's there's a, really a couple different ways that an investor can access private equity. They can go and hire a general partner who's gonna go out and select 30 companies in, for their portfolio. So that'll be a like, direct investment into a general partner's fund. Or they can hire a fund of funds manager who is who's demonstrated some expertise in selecting great general partners and building a diversified portfolio of you know 20 or 30 different general partners so that you have a, a, a more spread out portfolio. Uh, but let's let's just assume that we're talking about a conventional direct investment in a general partners fund. Okay. There's three phases. One is the fundraising phase. So this is where the, the general partner is going to the marketplace and saying, we're raising X amount of capital for the next year or so. Uh, and the, they're engaging with institutions, financial advisors, and indiv- high net worth individuals to say, here's what we're going to attempt to do. But what they're, what they're doing that with is simply using their historical track record and a broad uh, description of their investment approach. Hmm. There's no portfolio companies that they're kind of doing that fundraising on, but they're able to do that, particularly the firms that have been around for a while, because they can point to their history as investing in this company or that company that realized a great value. So there's fundraising, call that a kind of a year one, Mm -hmm. uh, phase one. Um, Phase two would be the investing stage. So this is where the general partner has, say, raised a billion dollars in capital. Uh, and, and now they're, they're decided, well, I've got this billion dollars of capital. Now I'm going to go look in the marketplace for companies that need investment, require investment, that are attractive to, to, to them from a return perspective and decide over that two to four year, years, two through four, where they're going to invest the portfolio. So let's just say they've, they've arrived at 30 companies. They're going to spread that billion dollars out over. In years, call it uh, you know, four through ten, and maybe even longer, is the uh, what we, we call the, uh, the, the the phase where the the actual underlying companies are calling for capital to make those operational improvements or to expand their uh, their footprint from an opera, uh, from a from a ge- geographic standpoint. And so there's there's money that's coming, leaving the general partner, going to the underlying companies, and some of those companies are going to realize that. Uh, returns pretty quickly because they might be able to take that capital, uh, make the investments they need, and it 
turns out that they can actually go public. And so all of a sudden, the capital starts flowing back to the general partners and ultimately to the limited partners who are the investors. Uh, and, and so that, that's the three phases, right? There's the mm -hmm. fundraising, the investing, and then call, call it the uh, harvesting, if you will, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the underlying investments. Uh, why, why the J curve is a, is a kind of shorthanded way to describe that is uh, as the in underlying investor, the limited partner, uh, you're experiencing effectively calls on your capital in that, in that first couple of years, which means that relative to what you invested, you're, you're a bit underwater, right? You're not making any return on that money at that point. Uh, but uh, come years, you know, call it four through 10, that's when you expect to realize gains through those investments uh, as those companies either merge with others or go public, and, and, and you experience the upward slope of, of returns that are available. And thus, that, that, that's the shorthanded way of describing um, what happens in private e equity investing, the J-curve. And I always, um, when I think of the, the J-curve, I always rem uh, think of the, I got a third grader right now, so I always think of the, the penmanship lines where you got the line and the J is going underneath it, the the bottom of the belly there. So I, I kind of, that's how I think of it is all the, the dotted lines back to third grade when they may kind of start doing the J curve thought. But uh, when it comes to, I want to hear a little bit about uh, when you hear the term private equity, you know, there, I think there's a lot of assumptions out there. So we like to myth bust a little bit, right? So there's assumptions that this, this type of investment, somebody invests in it, you know, and many of these businesses, they just go bankrupt. So can you hear, can you just explain a little bit about, because um, I know we're talking like umbrella private equity and how people can invest, but there's different types of private equity investing out there. Can you talk a little bit about just compare and contrast angel investing and buyout and venture, those sorts of labels and how they maybe differentiate um, in terms of when maybe in a company's life cycle, we might be investing in them? Sure. I think uh, you know, bankruptcy is a uh, an occurrence that happens across companies of different maturities, uh, of, of, of different areas of the market, of being private or public, right? So it, it's not a, um, uh, an experience that's uh, endemic to um, uh, private equity. But I, I think maybe if we talk a little bit about the, the types of private equity, it probably provides a little bit more color where, where that risk probably exists the most, right? So right. Um, you made the point around angel investing. I kind of started off talking about what angel investing looks like. It's two people in a garage with an idea. Right? There, there's capital that shows up there that thinks this idea is good and kind of what, what can you do with that idea to translate it into some, to a real company? That's probably a, a higher risk type of investment, right? That the, uh, the probability of trading, translating an idea into a business uh, is uh, lower than, say, if you already have an existing business in place. And so, perhaps that's where this notion that more bankruptcies occur it probably uh, uh, take place. And I, I think that's pretty reasonable. Uh, you know, you, from the next stage though would be venture investing, right? So you've transitioned from being two people in a garage with an idea to actually having a business and building out an operation. Right, so now there's a little bit more maturity. Again, I think that risk exists as well, uh, but but you're, you're you're closer to having something uh, like a product to actually sell uh, mm -hmm. at this point to uh, enable a business to be a viable uh, long-term offering. From from there, you move into growth. Right, so these are these are companies that have gone from the idea to a uh, business to actually uh, selling a meaningful product. And these growth investments, uh, these tend to be companies that are trying to scale their operation in some way. Maybe they're, they're regional in nature, uh, but now they're ready to take a, a more national approach to making their product available in the marketplace. Uh, they need a capital infusion there. Again, it's a more mature organization, uh, more breadth to it. The probability of bankruptcy probably declines there. And then maybe the last group that I'll talk about would be buyout. So think of buyout really as companies that uh, either public or private, but uh, I'll go back to the Dell example, uh, a public company where uh, you know, perhaps there is an opportunity to right-size the operations, re refocus the strategy of the organization, uh, recapitalize the balance sheet in some way, shape, or form. Uh, these companies are you know, usually larger in, in, in size. And so they, they tend to, um, you know, again, I'd say the risk around bankruptcy probably declines there. But, so it just, it, I think what, 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 what has, has to be pretty, hopefully pretty, pretty clear to uh, the audience would be that yeah, bankruptcies are a possibility, but just like uh, in, the, in the public markets, 
it, it kind of depends upon where you are in the life cycle and a maturity of, a, of an idea of a business uh, where it's actually going to show up. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't paint uh, with, a, with a broad brush on that topic, just like I wouldn't paint private equity with a broad brush, brush as uh, a single monolithic idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's good. I'm glad you kind of broke those out that way. Um, so I want to talk about kind of the trends in finding capital to grow companies, right? So I think people probably traditionally are more familiar with large companies. You know, they would go borrow money from investors, right? Issue bonds, for example, or they sell their stock uh, to the public through IPOs to get capital to grow. So one thing that we read and, and we've heard that stuck out to us is the and this came from Investopedia. So the the Wilshire 5000 index, right? It tries to capture 100% of the investable U.S. market. Um, it typically contained more than 5,000 stocks to do so. Uh, recently, only contains 3,687 stocks. Um, so I just want to ask kind of your reaction and how does private equity fit into that statistic, and how is it inv- impacting investors' ability to capture the growth of investable companies today? Sure. Uh, it's a topic actually I used to spend a lot of time on in my old job in, in the ETF world as, yeah. as, the, as the pool of uh, investable companies continue to, to shrink. Listen, I think um, if, you look, if you look at that from a, a raw count standpoint, the trend is uh, inarguable that, that fewer and fewer companies are, are, are public. Mm-hmm. Uh, the market capitalization of the public market, public equity marketplace, so uh, is in, uh, inarguably materially larger. Right? You just simply look at the, the largest companies and their market cap relative to say, the, the 10 years ago, largest company, uh, there are four or five, maybe 10 times larger in terms of size. And so there, there's a variety of factors that are happening there. I, I think a couple of things that are driving why, say, companies are staying private for longer. One, there's a regulatory burden of going pro, uh, public, sure. right? There's uh, additional audit requirements and filings. There's certainly uh, a meaningful more scrutiny from a regulatory, even from a public marketplace perspective. And yeah. so I think that is are the reason why companies are staying private for longer. Uh, the availability of capital would be another reason, right? That that the uh, underlying a pool of capital to finance companies who are in the angel venture growth uh, stages of their maturity is, is larger today. And so a company can stay private for longer, build out the business to a maturity level where you know, perhaps they, at, at a later stage in their life, they can uh, become a, a public company. And so uh, that, that um, I think, is part of the reason why we see uh, a, a, gro- a smaller public market in terms of count and a growing uh, private market in terms of count. And, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that trend changing uh, materially. Uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier that about 10% of the global equity market cap is in private yeah. companies. Yeah. 20 years ago, if we were talking, uh, certainly we, w- we wouldn't have been on this platform because it didn't <laughs> exist. But, uh, but uh, you know, that, that number was closer to 1% or 2% of, the, of yeah. the equity market cap. And so I, I think there's some of those trends that are, are, are drivers of it. And, I, and, and there's reason to believe that um, uh, it, it will continue at least for the, the foreseeable future. Mm. So, Rich, let's let's kind of so you did a great job about painting kind of the where we are today and where why companies are choosing private versus going public, and also where we have been in the last twenty years. But let's look in the crystal ball in the future, right? So, how is how is PE in the future? Uh, how is it changing today? And and do you see time in the future where an everyday investor will be able to easily access PE? Yeah, well, I, uh, but I really like the point you made earlier, which is that a lot, a lot of investors, uh, individuals already have access to PE through, say, a pension investment that they have. And so uh, in many ways, it's, it's reached the, uh, uh, the masses uh, in a, uh, a less obvious, but, but nevertheless mm-hmm. powerful way. And so uh, I think that exists. I think there, there's been some talk from a regulatory standpoint, and it really depends upon uh, different regimes that are in place from a regulatory standpoint as to who's enthusiastic about making PE more available to investors or not. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to say kind of where things are t- today. Uh, but, but I think uh, what, what's inevitable is that more in individual investors will have access to PE uh, in the future than, than have in the past. And, and I say that for a variety of reasons. Um, one, uh, the, the firms who offer, who, who have historically uh, been PE firms who have gone to endowments and foundations and, other institutions for capital, they are now branching into the retail space, right? So they are either developing products in partnership with a, a financial advisory firm or a, a broker dealer, um, 
They are making listed products available for individuals to purchase. Uh, and so they are looking at this, uh, the individual investor as underserved really mm. um, in, in, in accessing the private markets. I, I think there is reason to be, uh, to look at that uh, with a skeptical eye in some ways, right? Because you'd say, well, are, the, are, are these firms coming to the, 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 uh, the individual investor market uh, with the best of intentions, right? This is simply a cash grab and a, a capital raise. Uh, and I, I think what that means is that align, as an individual investor, aligning yourself with a financial advisor or a firm who can do the type of research to vet the really great PE firms from the very average ones is gonna be really, really important because it, the average PE firm uh, fund probably gives you about public market returns. Is that worth the effort if you have to tie up your capital for, for all this time? So that's why working with a professional who can do the due diligence and make those decisions on your behalf is gonna be really powerful. So I, I do think more and more individuals are gonna uh, have access to PE, but, but, but just simply blindly buying PE is, is not gonna be a strategy that's gonna um, to lead to lots of happy outcomes. I think be having a discerning eye, having a professional that's working for you is, is gonna make a, a world of difference there. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to keep going here, Rich. And uh, back in our intro, we talked about how there might be a level of skepticism, um, you know, that many communities and speaking where Ben and I are located, smaller communities uh, have when investors are coming in and purchasing local businesses and, you know, private equity is uh, then becoming, you know, finding ways to save costs, grow revenue, right, to to create returns for those investors. Um and I think in some cases, it's kind of, again, speaking specifically to our, our lovely uh, rural state, um, in some cases, cases, the management decisions of the private equity fund uh, might be at odds with the goals of the communities. And even on the, the ground level of, you know, sponsoring a Little League team or, or having local jobs or cutting jobs that affect people in the local community. So can you just talk about, you know, is that a fair critique or is it unfair? Is it an unfair label that's being applied to the whole industry of private equity? I'll go back to the bankruptcy example. Yeah. So we talked about before, I, I think again, painting the too broad of a brush, I think um, is a dangerous thing here. Yeah. Uh, certainly there are instances where a private equity firm acquires a company and uh, the decisions they make is to uh, take costs out of the system. And it could mean, uh, uh, laying off workers, shutting down operations. It's mm -hmm. painful for everyone involved. Uh, and uh, that certainly does happen. Uh, but but I, I would say that that's not necessarily the majority of actions that we, 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 yeah. we tend to see here. And, this is, and, and then oftentimes that could be in places where perhaps capital isn't being used, used to, to, in its best service. Uh, and, and again, hard for the individuals who are impacted by that. Sure. Uh, but, but there could be an economic rationale why that's the case. But I would say the majority actually uh, of, of private equity falls in that bucket where there's there's job creation and formation because the, the angel, those angel investments, those venture investments, uh, those growth investments, they're allowing companies to companies that didn't exist to, to exist uh, mm -hmm. for companies that do exist to grow their footprint, grow their, their their job creation capabilities and their economic output. So I look at it as, yes, it happens, but there are all, also many great aspects of private equity investing, just, just like you would characterize on the, on the public equity side of things. Yeah. And, and I know there's, um, you know, to that point, and I know there's a lot of great things happening around the state of Maine as well from, um, you know, there's a really passionate group of Maine citizens that are Maine angels, right? And they, mm -hmm. they do invest it. So it's just creating this um, ecosystem of getting capital across every size of business. And I think that's what, what I think the state of Maine is really trying to do and using all the levels of access to capital so that we can continue to attract businesses and grow and create jobs. So, uh, Rich, I think you did a great job kind of yeah. touching on that because I, I think that's really important to highlight is, yes, there's good and bad with everything that's out there, but it's really easy to just look at this and say, hey, there's an example that my friend or my buddy lost their job, that they had been there for 20 years because management um, you know, accepted uh, some private equity money, got consulting and decided long-term to grow the business they had to shrink in the near term. So again, sometimes it's a little tough to judge what the decision is until you kind of get a little more of the facts. But I, I want to hear a little bit about, obviously, Rich, in terms of your role, right, is head of private equity, very new in 2022. Um, you know, and, and 
obviously private equity is not something that Vanguard's kind of known for. So a little, I'd like to hear a little bit about how Vanguard is positioning your clients with private equity. So what sort of initiatives are you working on or is there anything that you can share with us there? Yeah, I can say that uh, in the entirety of my time here at Vanguard, that we have been looking at private equity in some set way, shape, or form uh, for almost that entire period, perhaps even before, and nobody's told me that. Uh, but but, uh, but certainly during the 20-some years that I've been here. Uh, but we decided to enter uh, private equity in, in 2020. Uh, we, we offer a, a, a private product that's only available to uh, our uh Endowments and foundations that where we where the advisor is it's it, uh, the shorthand for this is called outsource CIO where where Vanguard manages the, the pool of assets for a small endowment or a foundation uh, and then we also offer it to our ultra high net worth investors who qualify uh, from a suitability as well as a regulatory standpoint from an asset standpoint and through our personal advisor services uh, organization which is uh, our, our version of a, a hybrid advice where you have an advisor. You interact with, but it also high level of technology which you, you interact. And so uh, that's where the our, our current uh, PE offer uh, extends. It's a private offer. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're we're a couple of years in. Certainly, we're, we're pretty thrilled with the adoption uh, along the way. Uh, and, and the reason why we're doing this uh, again, I'll come back to where we started, which is we exist to serve our investors, right? And so our conclusion as we were thinking about entering this marketplace was. Is, is this going to be valuable to investors and add to their diversification and to their uh, potential for maybe realizing their investment outcomes, right? And enhancing their returns. And our conclusion unequivocally was, yes, it will. Uh, uh, certainly there's risk with this, uh, but we, we believe we can add value to client portfolios. And so uh, we're making it available to those investors and uh, the uptake has been good. Of course, feedback and questions. And I think we've spent probably the, the last couple of years educating a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. I think the endowments and foundations that we serve, pretty familiar with PE, but maybe couldn't access the quality of PE that we're bringing to market through through, through HarborVest, uh, who is our partner on this. Uh, and, and then for the retail investors, some of them are familiar with PE. And so this is uh, allowing them to access PE through the Vanguard platform that they know and, and trust. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but a bunch of folks, PE is, is brand new. And so explaining, much like we've talked about today, some of the differences and similarities to what they're familiar with already has, has been where we spent a lion's share of our time. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And it, obviously it's exciting and new. And and I think you you hit the nail on the head with the educational, which is what we're trying to do here with this conversation, right? Is, is bring education to private equity and, and our clients and our listeners. Um, so I do have kind of a wrap up question for you, Rich, uh, before we let you go. So obviously the name of our show is retirement success, uh, in main podcast. So we'd like to ask all of our guests, how are you personally going to find your, uh, retirement success when you get there? Yeah, I think for, for me, hopefully it's, uh, starts with good health. Um, mm -hmm. I think second, um, that I'd be comfortable enough from a financial perspective that, uh, you know, be able to spend time uh, with those that I love, right? Uh, as much time as, as, and support them in any ways that I can. I think the, the, the third thing that kind of comes to, to mind for me would be the ability to travel. You know, I, I've had a benefit of traveling for work and also personally, certainly appreciate that. If I can mix in some music, that would be great. I'm a big, big music fan. That, that, uh, and, and then the last thing would just be, um, I find I found a passion over, over the years for education, right? So, so mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form, staying connected to that and, you know, either helping a local community or being involved in, in teaching in some way, shape, or form. I think that would be like a, a really nice way to kind of uh, put a bell on, on what retirement would look like for me. That's awesome. Rich, that's a, that's a fantastic answer. Um, we really can't thank you enough for coming on our show today, lending your expertise to our audience around private equity, what it is, what it isn't, um, how it's working and, and where it's going. So thank you so much. Uh, we can't wait to hear a little bit more maybe down the road from you about where things are going, but um, thank you and catch you next time. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate the time. So episode 71. 71. Um, yeah. Private equity in your retirement. What should you know? Yeah. Again, good to have, geez, trying to swing for the fences here. We said, <laughs> well, hey, let's ask a head of private equity at Vanguard and see That's if right. uh, see if they would come on our show. And yeah, we were we were very, um, very fortunate and uh we're we're extremely um uh, blessed that we we got to talk to Rich today and yeah. and be able to share him with you because I, I think hearing from somebody that um, again explaining it in a way 
you know, here's a very complex topic and explain it a way that we all can consume it. And we all kind of get where, where we're going, right. Is mm-hmm. I know there's, we could spend probably another eight hours on what this is and how it works and yeah. all that. But, um, but yeah, I think hitting some highlights is, was the goal. And I think Rich, uh, Rich uh, really did that in spades. So mm-hmm. again, we always like to wrap up our show with things that we learned or we wanted to take away from today's show. Sure. So Chris, what was something that you took away from our conversation with Rich today? Yeah, it, it, it came up a couple of times, I think, in our conversation. It was about kind of painting that broad brush, if you will. And it, it probably could apply to things more than private equity. I think we could all hear this, mm-hmm. but it um, specifically today and the, the piece about the, the local communities, it was the conversation we were having. And I think more and more specifically in Maine, I know we're seeing it recently in these companies that have been kind of longstanding family or or locally operated owned uh, businesses here are being uh, acquired by private equity funds. And I think it's happening more and more. And, and I get the reaction that people have, right? If the Little League team can't get sponsored, if someone loses a job, like it's terrible. I get it. Um, but I think it's important, and Rich pointed this out, to to really think about the goal here, right? The goal is for these funds not to, like, they're not sitting there saying, let's go into Bangor, Maine, and just destroy their lot. Like, the goal is growth. They're trying to grow the company. They're trying to, right? They're, it is an investment. They're trying to make a return on that investment. But they're not coming here just to put people out of business. And mm-hmm. and I think it's important to remember that and in the, the short-term pain that it may or may not cause. I get it. But I think it's just to to remember the bigger picture and the goal of these funds. And and I think that'll, it's a, a good takeaway. And again, private equity or not, I think sometimes it's good to just look at the big picture in all aspects mm-hmm. of life. So there's my, that's my spiel. Okay. No, <laughs> I like that. And, and I think that's something where, you know, going through and understanding, well, again, what, what it is out there in the community. And uh, we kind of talked about uh, how a lot of us maybe have, uh, public equity in our lives, uh, yeah. in our investable savings somehow, um, even in an indirect way, it, it very much touches a lot of our um, kind of future in terms of our income. So yeah. through embers and things of that nature. Yeah. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, again, one thing that we didn't touch on a whole lot today, but in terms of we talk about who can access it and what, and you know how is a, something we kind of touched on a little bit. And, and one of the things that um, that Rich was talking a little bit about was getting access to a fund to fund, right? Somebody that yeah. just says, Hey, here's who the best ones are out there of private equity. And they help make those picks for you versus mm-hmm. you and I walk up to some private equity manager and say, we yeah. have money we'd like to give you. And, 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 you know, when you have the Harvards and Yales out there that are, they just choose the best managers, then what's left over for, you know, the guidance points of the world to go and, and get sure. access to. So sure. cause they get all the money they really need from these really large endowments and foundations That's right. and pensions. So I, I think that's something where to kind of realize as Rich said, but also a lot of them are, you know, as Rich was talking about these 10 to 14 year windows, and, you know, it, I kind of view this as planting um, like a vineyard, you know, you plant your, your grapes, right. And, you know, you don't know uh, based on water over that time frame how good the mm-hmm. grapes are going to be. There's years that, you know, there might be volcanic ash in the air and the trees suck up uh, volcanic ash with the water from the rain. And all of a sudden you can have a crop that might not be great. You could have the next year that's cropped pretty good. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what private equity is too, is it's um, it it is meant to be kind of on a year by year basis and rotated through a portfolio. So if I'm in retirement, my, my, why I'm bringing this up is if I'm a retirement, I'm retiring at 62 and I make an investment that might be 10 to 14 years down the road. And I have to do this year by year by year to really realize all the benefits of, of these sorts of funds, you know, the, getting your money back and having the ability to lock up your money for that period of time is not really attractive for a lot of people. Sure. Right. And that's, I think why you've seen certain investors profiles work and some not. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's um, again, I think we're, or some people want to access it and they have enough money for maybe one vintage of a fund. And what we don't want to do is do that. And it be the one that, maybe had the bad yield or the the bad crop that year, that sort of thing. So I, th- I think there's lots of things to go through as we talked about suitability. 
are you right for it? But also how can we do it? We want to make sure it's doing right. I think those are things to consider and work through. And as Rich said, is working with your advisor. If it's not us, that's okay. Uh, but yeah. working through those things together of, is this right for me? And what are the things I should know? Um, maybe this is a good foundation for you to hear and maybe yeah. hear twice uh, yeah. to go through and then have those conversations with your advisor and figure that out. So yeah, hopefully that did that for you today. Um, we will have a little bit more um, on our website. You can go to blog.guidancepointllc.com backslash seven one, because this is episode 71 of Retirement Success in Maine. So you can go there check that out. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in today. Um, we're really excited about the direction where we're going um, and we'll catch you next time.